Remember that time when Waikiki Beach was covered in barbed wire and high fencing? And all those pillbox hikes that we love to go up and take pictures at at sunrise? Are they even really pillboxes? Not in their traditional military sense. Hi, I'm Jordan. This is the Hawaii Vacation Guide. And due to the war going on in Ukraine, I thought it was appropriate to invite Ford from the Pearl Harbor Aviation Museum to share history about Hawaii during World War II and even before World War II. Talk about the civil defense and explain all this military things around the island that we like to hike, especially the pillbox hikes. And this isn't just a history lesson. I share three favorite pillbox hikes on Oahu. Start it up. I'm going to start off first with my favorite pillbox hike on the island, and it's All Trail's least favorite pillbox hike. But first off, all these pillbox hikes I'm going to describe, they're all moderate hiking trails. That's due to their elevation gain, their steepness, and they can get slippery when it gets muddy. They all provide these stunning views, so hence you have those factors at play. So my first pillbox hike is a Hukai pillbox hike. This is also known as Sunset Pillbox Hike or Sunset Trail. This is on the north shore of Oahu. I like it a lot because you can hike through the shade and a jungle, which makes it a lot of fun. There's some ropes to help yourself go up the trail and also some stairs. That's why I really like to take this hike with Henry. Now parking. Parking is at the Sunset Beach Neighborhood Park. You don't want to park at the elementary school. Look for signs for the trailhead. It's well marked. It's on the north side, uh, the jungle side. There's a sign for the trailhead. It's the least popular pillbox hike on all trails due to it to be relatively easy and people can get lost. There's a lot of trails at the top take people like into the jungle or into private property. What I recommend is just going to that first pillbox that is on public property and you're allowed to do that. And it's got beautiful views of North Shore and the coast. It looks amazing. It's a 734 foot elevation gain and it's two miles out and back. Now, the history of this pillbox. I couldn't find any definitive sources on what it is, but it's most likely similar to the other pillboxes on the island that you go on hiking with. They actually weren't made as like machine gun pillbox areas. There was no military artillery in there. That's why it's not officially a pillbox. They were built as observation areas. And this one, I'm pretty confident, is observation area because there's some ducting in it, like uh, air conditioning ducting. So probably had observation equipment inside of it that they wanted to keep cool. Let's talk about the history of pillboxes and specifically the fire control station at the top of Diamond Head. So we'll cut over to my interview with Ford from the Pearl Harbor Aviation Museum. Aloha, Jordan. Thanks for having me. I'm the uh, youth programs manager at the Pearl Harbor Avi Aviation Museum. The military presence in Hawaii has been around for a good long time. Uh, in fact, in 1905, the U.S. government paid $3,300 for Diamond Head Crater. Can you imagine that? Wow, $3,300. And it totaled over 720 acres wow. for $3,300. And this area was developed into Fort Ruger, which along with Fort DeRussi in Waikiki, on the west side of Waikiki, was the backbone of the US Army coastal artillery defense for a number of years. Fort Ruger, which was located in, in the crater of Diamond Head, provided the key defense for the eastern end of Honolulu. And this is an aerial photograph of Diamond Head and the landmark iconic feature of Diamond Head runs along the western side that most of our visitors see. The visitors could actually hike to the top of this portion of Diamond Head here, but they had gun emplacements all around the eastern side of the, of the crater. In fact, if you look here, you'll see these two little white marks here. Mm -hmm. Those are gun emplacements in the side of, of Diamond Head. And Fort Ruger was located on this side of Diamond Head. The reason why they utilized Diamond Head was because of its strategic location. There was a battery known as Bar Battery Harlow on the north slope of Diamond Head. And it contained eight 12-inch mortars. And other batteries inside the craters were designed to fire to the south over the crater to hit ships at sea. Battery Harlow was located here. 
So it was designed to launch these huge mortar rounds to protect the water area along Waikiki and along the Eastern shore. Some of these guns as, as pictured here could traverse 360 degrees. So it had a, a full range of, of fire and it was designed so that these guns could actually fire over the Ko'olau Mountains to the north and reach Kaneohe Bay on the windward side. Ooh. And this is in, in the early 1900s, 1911, 1915. Along with Battery Harlow and the gun emplacements in, in Diamond Head, you had Fort DeRussi. And Fort DeRussi contained a number of batteries, but one key battery was called Battery Randolph. That battery is still in existence today. It is still uh, in Fort DeRussi, right along the, the, the shore of uh, Waikiki Beach. And it was comprised of two 14 inch naval type guns. And these guns were similar to the ones that you found on battleships that were berthed at Pearl Harbor at the time. So those are the big main guns that you normally see on the decks of the battleship. Well, Battle Battery Randolph was constructed in 1911 and was a key part of what they called the Ring of Steel, which encircled Oahu and defended the island against attacks by sea. The primary mission was, to, was the defense of Pearl Harbor and Honolulu from attacking battleships. Was there a specific threat they were worried about at the time? There was really no specific country or no specific threat, they, they just felt that if there was going to be a military engagement by an enemy, it would likely come from the sea. So at the turn of the 20th century, the greatest military threat to Hawaii, as I mentioned, was by sea. So Fort Ruger and Fort DeRussi, along with other defense, defense facilities, provided that protection from sea-based attack. Another purpose was to defend Honolulu from ground-based assaults to the south and eastern side of the islands. And like many of the beaches on Oahu, the area around Diamond Head had bunkers and pillboxes along its length in case of an enemy landing attempt. And the bunker high atop Diamond Head, as pictured here, was a fire control station. And it was there that soldiers could spot and control the coastal artillery fire on enemy naval targets out at sea. And as early as 1915, the Army began reevaluating its defense strategy based on the lessons that they learned in World War I and the effects of the new technology at the time. And that was the development of aircraft. The development of aircraft made large fixed gun positions like the ones that you saw at Fort DeRussi and Fort Ruger almost obsolete. Dece December 7, 1941 was the catalyst to that change. Almost overnight, warfare went from battleships to aircraft as the key weapons of war. Did a lot of these installations still exist in 1941? Oh, yes. In fact, Ruger, Fort DeRussi, and, and some of those other coastal installations were still in place during the war. And in fact, most of those uh, gun positions were not decommissioned until the early 1950s. The aerial attack that December morning would go on to change the lives of every American, especially those in Hawaii. Martial law was immediately imposed. Following the attack on Pearl Harbor, the US was not sure if Japan intended to invade the island. And so for that reason, they prepared for the worst case scenario and began to fortify the beaches and coastlines 
of Hawaii in anticipation of an invasion. And here you can see that barbed wire that was installed on Waikiki Beach with the iconic diamond head in the background. You can see people, if you removed that barbed wire in the pic picture, you wouldn't be able to tell that was a wartime photo. I mean, people are still frolicking in the water, sunbathing, having a grand time. But during the war, there was still that uncertainty of what was going to happen to the island. Here's another photograph of the coastal defense along Waikiki Beach with the Royal Hawaiian Hotel mm -hmm. off in the distance. Preparations to repel a land-based invasion was evident all over the island of Oahu, as well as the other islands. And this photograph shows a gun crew doing uh, battery drills off the coast of the North Shore of Oahu. In this photograph, you have soldiers manning a machine gun position at Ala Moana Beach Park in preparation for a possible land invasion by the Japanese. Obviously during the war, military presence on the island was quite obvious. You know, because of Hawaii's central location in the Pacific, it was the obvious stopping point for military personnel entering or leaving this battlefront. And here you have an incredible photograph of Kalakaua Avenue taken near the Moana Hotel. Mm -hmm. I oh yeah, you can see it. Yep, see it on the left there for sure, yep. where the coffee shop is, yeah. And I examined this photograph closely and of all the people strolling down the avenue, I could see only two people dressed in civilian clothes. And here's another photograph of military presence on Maui yeah. and military personnel waiting for the start of the Bob Hope Show on Maui in 1944. That, that gives you a very good idea of the presence, the military presence that was all over the island. Maui contained one of the largest concentrations of military personnel during the war because hmm. they used Maui extensively for training and preparation for soldiers going abroad. You know, unlike the population on the mainland U.S., Hawaii was considered in a war zone, susceptible to an enemy attack. And for fear that this enemy might use poisonous gas on the local population, gas masks were issued to all Hawaii civilians over the age of seven. And civil defense practices like this one were held to prepare for possible gas attacks or air raids. In school, classrooms conducted gas mask drills similar to how we conduct fire drills today. Most of the open spaces at schools throughout the territory that were formerly used for play at open air classrooms were eventually taken up by air raid shelters to serve the neighborhood as well as the school children. This scene that you see here of a local Honolulu school, Central Intermediate, shows a bomb shelter constructed right in front of the administration building. And this photograph, also of Central Intermediate School, uh, shows these young students hanging out at one of the air raid shelters. And I want you to note the gas mask bag they were required to carry and the barefoot, laid back island attitude of the time. Not all bomb shelters were enclosed. Here you have students from McKinley High School, my alma mater, conducting an air raid drill and are taking cover in a slit trench for protection as opposed to an enclosed bomb shelter. As, as I mentioned, I'm the youth programs manager at the Pearl Harbor Avi Aviation Museum. And with things kind of getting back to normal, are now able to afford uh, having on-site programs that we were not able to do for almost, what, year and a half. And uh, one of the things that we have now available 
is our Aviation Learning Center. It is a state-of-the-art center that there is only two others in the United States. One at the Museum of Flight in Seattle, and the other one is the Lone Star Aviation Museum. And so we're proud to, to be part of this. We now have the ability to service youth that are able to learn about the career of aviation and to, to actually fly in a simulator. We also are finally able to encourage schools to visit our museum. And, to, um, and so this was uh, that Central Middle School, that picture that I showed you? Yeah. That Central Middle School eighth graders. Oh, I love it. <laughs> of course, our scout programs, we have been doing scout programs since the museum opened up in 2006. And I'm proud to say that we have continued to service the scout programs on, on Oahu. And I thank you for allowing me to share that with you. Yeah, thanks for sharing it. Always good to hear about the Pearl Harbor Aviation Museum too and all the exciting stuff you guys have going on. So yeah, that's, that's fascinating to learn about the islands during the war like that. Yeah, people don't, I sure don't appreciate everything that the people on the islands went through during the war. You know, the you amount of sacrifice. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's true. Cool. All right, my second favorite pillbox hike on the island is Lanakai Pillbox, also known as Kaiba Ridge Trail. This is a beautiful place to hike because you get these sweeping views of Windward Oahu, especially Lanakai Beach and the Mokes out in the distance. It is a 1.7 mile out and back hike, 626 feet elevation gain. It takes about 30 minutes or less to get to the second pillbox. Yes, there's two pillboxes on this hike. It is steep in the beginning, very steep, and there's ropes to help out. If it's wet, best of luck out there. So it's not great for young kids due to a steepness, and there's also no guardrails. The trailhead is opposite the Mid-Pacific Country Club and Golf. When you do get to the top, you get rewarded with these great views of the Mokes, panoramic views of Lanakai Beach, and lots of places for photos. It's very popular for sunrise. The trail can get overcrowded though. That's why I don't love it. There's always a lot of people there. And a quick PSA, parking is very limited. You have to park in the neighborhood of Lanakai on street parking. Please don't block driveways, pay attention to the signs, and respect the neighbors. Especially if you're doing the sunrise hike, don't wake anybody up. In quick history on the pillbox, it was built in 1943. It was built as an observation post, observation pillbox, if there is such a thing. There's no military artillery ever in this pillbox, strictly for observation during World War II. My third favorite pillbox hike on the island is Coco Crater Tramway. This is a fun one because you get to hike up an old World War II tramway. It is just outside of Waikiki on the eastern side of Oahu near Hanama Bay. It is a 1.6 mile out and back trail. It takes about 1.25 hours to complete. Yes, I know that's exact. It's going to depend for you because it's challenging due to the climb up the tramway. It's 880 foot elevation gain and there's over 1,000 steps. Lucky for you, the Coco Coalition volunteers have been fixing it up, making it a lot safer, a lot easier to hike. Because when I was on it with Henry, there's definitely some scary parts to it, trying to balance on the tramway. And it is from World War II. It is a World War II inclined tram that was used to send supplies to another observation station at the top. Hence, it is also not officially a pillbox, but regardless, it looks like a pillbox and you get these beautiful views. Now, a big one, it's become really popular for sunrise. Don't disagree, nice place for sunrise, but I don't recommend going. You park at Cocoa Head Crater Park during the day, but in the early morning before the sunrise, the park is closed, so there's no parking allowed. So then you're forced to park in the neighborhood. And the neighbors are getting really upset with people not being very friendly and, and being very loud and blocking driveways. Kids can do this, but with a thousand steps, my toddler couldn't get all the way to the top. Plus it's really hot during the day. We're getting cooked out there. So we headed downhill and went to Hanama Bay afterwards, which is just across the street. Reservations are required for Hanama Bay. So it's a nice thing to pair together. And that reminds me, if you're looking for an itinerary when you're coming to Oahu, you want your days planned out, great excursion days all over the island, check out our itinerary. I got a link below in the description all the great places to go, how to fit into a day, or favorite place to eat, plus we talk about parking, it's all you need, it really is, it's all you need. Bonus, the last two things about military installations that you can hike to. A fourth pillbox is called the Pink Pillbox. I've never hiked to it, but there's a lot of information on all trails for that. So that's another one to check out. A famous one is Stairway to Heaven. This is on the windward side of the island. I did this over 10 years ago, but it was illegal at the time, so sorry, and it's still illegal. 
and it's illegal because the Sears are just deteriorating. There's this, they're just falling apart. Honolulu is actually planning on destroying all the stairs, removing them because they're tired of rescuing people from the stairway. Please don't hike the stairway of heaven. It is not worth it. You don't want a helicopter to come scrape you off the mountain. Thanks to the Pearl Harbor Aviation Museum to participate in this and share the history. We love going there. Click the link in the description below. Learn more about the Pearl Harbor Aviation Museum. And yes, it is at Pearl Harbor. So we can go to Pearl Harbor, check it out. Thanks so much for watching.